Welcome back. We're now going to look at regression. Regression is a really important analysis that is often undertaken with a lot of market research and other forms of analysis. Regression analysis, regression analysis rather, is undertaken to statistically establish the extent of influence of an independent variable or independent variables on, on a dependent variable. For example, does a person's height impact upon their IQ? Or as a consumer spends more time on our website, are they more likely to spend more money? In which case we've got a clear independent variable and dependent variable. When all our variables are continuous scaled, i.e. they're not normal, nominal or ordinal variables, then we use linear regression. This is the only type we're going to feature in this video. So why do we do regression? It's the best method to establish statistical causality and thus is widely used in a huge variety of disciplines, including economics, psychology and marketing as well, amongst others. We use regression, particularly multiple regression, to test conceptual models and their associated hypothesis. Without it, we have to rely on correlations, which don't prove a statistical relation of one variable on another, but rather an association between two. The link in the transcript below will take you to a web page which should hopefully make it clear that correlation cannot be used to assume causality, and thus co correlation alone should not be used to guide decision making or give advice to clients. That's where regression comes in. How do we do regression analysis? Now, in SPSS, firstly we select Analyze, and we go down to Regression, Linear Regression. Let me just resize the window a little bit. Now, we have dependent and independent. In the dependent window, we want to put our dependent variable. In the independent variable, we put our independent variables. So in this case, we're going to look at a range of variables impacting on the likelihood of joining a membership club for a pet store. So the outcome is the likelihood of joining the membership club. That's our dependent variable. And we have a range of independent variables. Now, what we're going to do for that, firstly, though, is create a few um, variables based upon some of the EFA analysis, and then we're going to use some of the other variables. So I'll stop that one there for a second, and then we'll go through and actually compute some new variables. So to compute a new variable, we want to go transform, compute variable. Oh, bear with me. Um, and what we want to do for this is basically based upon our previous EFA regression. I'll just put the output up, bear with me. Here we have this one here. So we can see that we've got our three factors that clearly emerged there. Factor one, factor two, factor three. So we're going to create a mean of these variables and use those as part of our analysis. So the first one we're going to do, we're just going to call it factor one mean at this point. Again, underscores because SPSS doesn't like space. We're going to type in mean. Sorry. Open the bracket of parentheses. And now our first one, if we look back to our output, related to 7, 5, item 7, 5, and 2 for pet pampers. So we go double click 7, comma, double click 5, comma, double click 2, close bracket. Now what we're creating here is a mean variable of the scores for those three items that we determined based upon our EFA related to each other. Now, again, I haven't labeled those correctly. We should be labeling them, um, but we'll worry about that later. Now we can do factor two mean. This is one, and in this case, I'm just going to change it because I know what the names of the variables are, but it's always best practice to actually select the variables from the left. And that was eight, six, and four. Transform compute, factor three mean. And that was the other three, three, one, and nine. Okay. And we're done. Again, our output tells us we've created new variables based upon these means. We can now check these. I'm going to bring them up and then see that their means actually make sense. So factor one, which related to variables seven, five, and two, we can see it here, seven, five, two. Just manually checking, we can see for our case number one, three, three, and three, obviously the average for that would be three, seven, four, and four, average for five makes sense, six, 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 six. So that seems to have worked correctly. And just for the sake of time, we'll assume, assume the others have worked correctly. I would label it correctly based upon um, mean equals, uh, variable equals factor, or PP seven, five, and two for the first one, etc. So we've got all the information. We're using decimals as two because it is a mean. So it makes sense to have other than whole numbers. And then also our scales are already set.
So now we've got these new variables to use as part of our analysis, and we're going to bring them into our regression analysis. So analyze, regression, linear, dependent variable, likelihood of joining the club. We'll do those three, which I've moved to here, factor one, two, and three, into our independence column. We also want to look at purchase history, and then also want to look at the number of social media sites followed. Cool. So now we've got five independent variables um, and one dependent variable. We can then select statistics. Um, so that's coming in a different window. And we'll get descriptives and ask word as well, just to be sure. So OK. And here we go. Now we've got our output. So we can see in our descriptives, we've got the means and the standard deviations, as well as the number of respondents for each of these variables. We can see what those are. Not particularly useful when it comes to a regression. We can look down at the correlations. Now, we want to look at this first box here, and we can notice that the correlation on the diagonal is always one, because this is each variable correlating with itself. It's a little bit messy there, but we can see that obviously every variable correlates perfectly with itself. So this is for that one. Factor one, factor one is one. Um, and with the, the ones below the one, they'll be the inverse of the ones above the one. So for example, we can see um, that we've got 2.95 here and 2.95 here. So they're just the, the opposing, well, they're just the, the same sort of options of themselves. Negative 0.68, negative 0.68, 1.86, 1.86. And it's a little bit messy to see them there, but if we made them all a bit cleaner. So what we can do is look at these correlations. We can see the only really ones of significance, well, not statistically, but just on face value, this one here, 0.452, membership club and purchase history. Uh, this one, 0.295, not too bad. Um, there's a couple of others. Let's have a look. No, that's really it. The only real ones that are worth mentioning. 0.1, negative 0.116, sort of a little bit there. But the idea is that we want to know if there is substantial correlation. A better way to check that is statistical significance. So this here relates to the significance associated with that variable. In other words, where testing statistically whether it's different from one. Our null hypothesis, sorry, different from zero. Our null hypothesis is zero, that there is no correlation between the two variables. And we want to be able to disprove that with 95 or reject that with 95% confidence. So to do that, we need a figure that is smaller than 0 0.05, because that's that 0 0.05 that corresponds with the 95. Um, and what we can see is this one is definitely lower than 0 0.05, because it's 0 0.000. Uh, we've also got a 0 0.048, so that one is just closely statistically significant. Um, yeah, this one here, this one here, 0 0.04. So we've got a few of them are uh, statistically significant correlations, which might be worth mentioning. But again, and then obviously we've got here just the number of respondents. But that isn't causality, that's purely correlation. So what we're going to do now is look onto our, oh, sorry, let me scroll down our coefficients, which is the most important one that we're looking at here. So in reviewing this, we're looking at the unstandardized beta first and its associated significance. What we can see in our coefficients table is that there's only one relationship that is statistically significant based upon this. And in that case, that's this one here. Now, we ignore the constant. The constant is something that's specific to each test we run. It'll always be different. Um, it does have statistical meaning, but we don't use it as part of our interpretation. So we ignore Pardon me, this one, the only non sorry, the only significant relationship from a regression perspective is how many times uh, they've purchased from the pet heaven in the last store, and that is having a statistical influence on the membership, uh, the likelihood of joining the membership club. So that's based upon our unstandardized coefficient and the significance. The way the significance is calculated is basically corresponds with the T value. Any T value greater than 0.196 or less than point negative, negative 0.196 will be statistically significant at the 0.05 level. Um, and what that comes from is the, the T, T value score is basically the standardized coefficient divided by the standard error. Um, and these will be rounded a little bit, so it might come out a little bit differently. Basically, if your unstandardized coefficient is twice the size of your error, you'll have a statistically significant relationship. Now that's really important to keep in mind because what we have here is a bunch of variables that are measured on different scale metrics. So for example, purchase history was measured on a scale of approximately zero to 40. Social media sites followed was one to four. And the pet pamper factors were measured on a, measure, a scale metric of one to seven. Intention to join the membership club, our dependent variable was on a scale of one to 10. So in this case, our unstandardized coefficients um, or the unstandardized size of the impact on, on of the dependent variable, sorry, on the dependent variable by the independent variable is going to be misleading because we're not comparing apples with apples. We've got a bunch of independent variables that are measured on very different scales. So that's a bit of a concern. So what 
for example, we're seeing when it comes to purchase history is that a one unit rise in the purchase history, um, or in other words, if they purchase from the store one more time over the last two years, is going to increase their likelihood of joining the membership club on the one to 10 axis of 0.164, and it's statistically significant. But that might not be actually meaningful because the fact that those scales are very different. One's about one to, zero to 40, one's one to 10. So because of this, we look at the standardized beta coefficients. Um, now these don't have a significance associated with them because they tell us a one standard deviation rise in the independent variable, the outcome on a one standard, the outcome on the um, of a standard deviation on the dependent. So in other words, the standard deviation of number of social media sites, as that increases by one, we're actually seeing a, a, a drop in the standard deviation of uh, the, the membership club likelihood of joining by a negative a drop of 0 0.03, so not a sizable impact. But standard deviations are really important because they give us a more meaningful metric um, when the scales are measured on different scales, so when the independent variables and dependent variables are all measured on different scales. Generally, a, an impact or a standardized impact of 0.1 um, is probably worth noting as meaningful. Um, which now changes our perspective a little bit because before we only had one statistically significant relationship, but looking at that sort of point one criterion, we can actually see that there's another one in this case, which sort of goes above that from a standardized perspective and that factor one's actually reducing um, by a, a standardized coefficient of point one. So that's telling us that factor one is actually having a, a interesting relationship or an, a meaningful relationship on uh, joining the membership club, in this case, reducing it, um, but not to the extent of which purchase history is increasing it. So purely going on the statistical significance of an unstandardized relationship is not a good thing. Um, if all scale of all the variables are measured on the same scale, it's not such a concern as in if they're all measured on one to seven, but when there's different ones, that is concerning. And that's what's known as the seduction of significance. The idea that people only look at the significance associated with the relationship rather than the size of the actual effect. And for doing that, the standardized coefficient is far better. So now for a client, we can determine what is impacting on people's intention to join the membership club with much more confidence by looking at the standardized coefficients um, rather than being purely clouded by the significance. Another interesting thing is to look at the R squared. The R squared value of 0.219, which is the square root of the R, R being the correlation of all the variables overall. Um, the R squared relates to basically telling us that 21.9, because of the 0.219, 21.9% of the variation in the dependent variable is explained by these five independent variables. Now that's not a lot. We'd want to be at least above 0.5 or 50% um, to really say that this model is explaining enough of the variance of the data, in which case we'd perhaps need to drop a couple of these variables that aren't having any statistical impact and perhaps consider some other ones um, and use those as part of our regression. So regression is great for seeing if an independent variable has an impact on a dependent. Um, it's certainly something that we use a lot within this industry and other industries and something you want to be familiar with. Thanks for that.